you know what? I am fired up about today's show. We have Scott Alvord. Uh, he is uh, a friend of mine from, actually, we've known each other a while. Uh, Scott is uh, a Roseville City Council person. He is an entrepreneur. I think he owns uh, close to half a dozen companies. But I think what's, what stands out to me about Scott is his unselfish demeanor is unselfish approach to uh, the Sacramento region, more specifically Roseville in the, in the area around South Placer, which is where I live, where I grew up. And just the amount of energy that he brings to helping our community to thrive. And uh, so Scott, I wanna thank you for, for joining me today. I've been meaning to get you on our show for a few years now. Finally, we got it done. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You betcha. So we want to get to know you. And I think one of the, uh, if I was to describe what's most, um, I guess, pressing to me, something we don't talk about every week is how to grow a region economically and the leadership that it really uh, is required in order to grow anything. But when you start talking about something as, uh, as big as, um, you know, a community, a, a city of Sacramento or a region like Sacramento or, or a city like Roseville or South or a region like South Placer. It's like, how do you approach this um, so that you can make a difference? And so you've done some things. I want to talk about what you've done. I want to, I want to look uh, maybe what you're thinking in terms of future um, and what we, the rest of us can do. And then I also want to want to highlight as we go through this the way you take an entrepreneurial approach um, and a partnership driven approach to uh, to this aspect of growing a region so maybe to start off with why don't you i don't know if i did you justice on uh, on the way i uh, introduced you so maybe give us just a little bit of your background and uh and why the city and regional growth is uh is so important to you well my my wife and i um Got married after I graduated from college. She was a year behind me. I started a software company when I was in college. We, we came to the Sacramento area as newlyweds. And a um, few years after getting here, we uh, suddenly had a family of four kids. And we sort of inherited her sister's four children. And we eventually adopted those four kids. And then had three birth kids after that. And so we've got seven children. They're all grown adults now and um, functioning well, thank God. And 10 grandchildren. That, that's been the center of my life for a long time. I brought my software business here. And when I went back and got my MBA, I started doing more business consulting. I, I worked in the Malcolm Baldrich Quality Awards Program, the California version. It's called CAPE. And I became a senior examiner, so I learned how to evaluate companies from the inside out and score them for these pretty prominent, prestigious awards. And that, that started me doing more and more business consulting. And, and so I changed the name of my company, um, my, my primary company, and, and was doing that. And then we opened, got this crazy idea to open a restaurant in downtown Roseville. And that was a blessing. We had it for a dozen years, um, probably four years longer than I, I should have had it. Um, but I was able to sell it, got a really good price for it in, in 2016. And but it was a great experience because that got me less involved in the family and church and the kids' school and more involved in the community and, and dealing with the downtown revitalization. And all of my children worked in the restaurant. Um, you know, some learned how to do payroll. I did everything in it. So I, I did, except for taxes, um, the, the annual taxes. I did all the employee payroll taxes and everything though. But it was a great experience for me as a business consultant because I was actually running every aspect of a very involved business, which of course sucks up every bit of your time when you're a restaurant owner. But a great experience for my family. And, and that got me more in tune with the civics downtown and working with council members over generations of council members. And um, I worked with your wife on the personnel board. Uh, fantastic lady. Um, but it was, it was a fun experience and it was neat to just get involved and started getting more involved in the neighborhoods in Roseville, Arcana, the Roseville Coalition and Neighborhood Associations, real strong group of neighborhoods all around the city and the police come to our monthly meetings and uh, fire departments come and we just stay involved and, and spread information you know, back to the city and we get it from them. 
Um, it's just a wonderful community, and my wife and I decided that we're going to retire here, so we bought our last house, which I'm in right now, and uh, this will be the place they drag my body out. Uh, and you're more stuck home. there probably today than uh, than you were this time last year, right? And, and yeah. We are on a Zoom call instead of face to face in my office or my by the podcast studio. And my car hardly gets exercise now. It's just Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you've given so much, uh, and you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I hear that there's no harder job in the world than uh, being the owner of a restaurant and uh, the way you described it. Luckily, you have a, a huge, a gigantic family. Uh, it sounds like that was uh, uh, enormously helpful. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they were part of the workforce. You know, there's always a couple of them that were always employed over the years. I remember my youngest son when he was eight years old running the cash register and the staff loved having him because he would get huge tips. <laughs> <laughs> He's so cute. Yeah. But it was, it was a fun experience. I mean, we employed um, you know, probably 30, 40 different people over the, that 12 year span. And so it was, it was just a fun experience teaching teaching kids how to mop a floor and they'd never knew how to mop a floor or um, how to unclog a toilet, <laughs> things like that. It was, just, it was kind of entertaining for me with, with new employees that have never had a job before. Well, let's, I want to talk about, I'm just, I like, uh, I like sharing stories in um, my, my uh, simplistic way of thinking about it is create a journey from why to how. So as we think about Sacramento and, and Roseville, right in the heart of Roseville is where you had your, your restaurant, your consulting business. I know you do business all over the place, but um, you know, you think about this uh, traditional in many ways, uh, small town business um, of a restaurant and how that uh, ended up being part of the passion that's led you to become now a council member. I know you're driving economic uh, growth initiatives. You're leading groups in and around South Placer in terms of economic growth. And it makes me think about the why, right? So why, why do we need economic growth? And in my mind, I've, I started this podcast because I thought that uh, and, I, and I strongly believe that entrepreneurs are the answer, right? Entrepreneurs take risk, entrepreneurs um, make sacrifices, and really, ultimately, they figure out a way to change the world, even if it's in sm some um, lesser uh, way in some people's minds of like a, a meal out that's got an eight-year-old behind the cash register. That made the world a little bit better place. Some people may be thinking, I'm going to cure cancer. I'm going to create software uh, that, that changes the world. Others may want to save the planet. But uh, something as simple as an entrepreneur succeeding and hiring employees, and that leads to different amounts of economic growth. And so I want to maybe talk to you a little bit about like what happens when a, uh, when a restaurant is successful or when a business is successful? What does that actually do? And, you know, you think about Roseville, it, I think it's uh, in many ways, it's been a, it's a model community. Uh, for um, for planning and it's it's grown well over the years, um, and it's not, it doesn't all come from the government agencies. My wife was a uh, Scott alluded to uh, the personnel board. My wife was the HR director for the city of Roseville, and she had a bunch of um, you know she worked with a bunch of government people that um, sometimes don't think as entrepreneurially as uh, as guys like you, Scott, but. We all know, even the people at the city of Roseville, and I would say especially the people at the city of Roseville, they appreciate it when an entrepreneur succeeds because, you know, it drives the tax dollar and it provides their jobs and, you know, gives us the ability to really have build a community. So I want, can, if you could elaborate on that, that would be helpful to me because I know I'm just covering the surface. Well, I know. So when, when we got the restaurant, I actually tried to buy a building downtown and thank God somebody beat me with a cash offer. So um, because it was right before, you know, everything took a crash many years ago. And so I ended up leasing a building, a 1920s building, and it was gutted. It had no plumbing, no electricity. It had all been ripped out of everything. And and so we built this thing from the ground up, put almost a quarter of a million dollars into this building. And the process of getting permits from the city, I, I hired um, a somewhat uh, acquaintance who had done a lot of residential construction. And so he was a contractor. And so he was coming in and helping me. 
And, and so we went down to the city and we wanted to get sample plans. Um, they didn't have any sample plans. So we you know, I hired an architect and we, we designed plans and took a guess at what they wanted, turned them in. They, they waited six weeks. This is way back. Uh, meanwhile, you know, we're kind of sitting there for six weeks, you know, cleaning out the inside of the restaurant and doing some basic stuff. I mean, the building, again, was gutted. We get the plans back and there's 20 items on it we need to fix, so no problem. So we, we adjust all those. We turn them back in. We wait six weeks. We get them back and now there's like another 20 brand new things that were, weren't caught last time. And, and I was mad. I was frustrated. So I went down. Um, Mark Walensky was my savior at the time. He still works at the city in a different capacity. But I was like, I, I am about out of money. And this is ridiculous. It's taken me months. And, and they keep finding new stuff. Can somebody just tell me what to do? You know, get this stuff figured out so we can get this stupid thing open. It took me 18 months to get my restaurant open. And, and it wasn't all the city. And we had some other delays. But, but a lot of it was. And it was so annoying. And so... But that process and me complaining, um, things started changing. And it wasn't just me, but I was just a, and I was president of the downtown merchants. Um, I, I served there for nine years. And in that capacity, that sharing that story, you know, stuff started changing with staff. Other merchants would come down and they would have problems and I would walk in there with them, you know, and hey, you know, how about this and that? And, um, and they've got to where they can turn the permits around really fast now. And that's, Roosevelt's really known for that. It, it's a real good process. I'm not positive they have sample plans or not. I would guess they do. Um, but the process I went through was a nightmare, and I hear it's not like that anymore. And that's, that's nice progress. And then having somebody who's gone through, you know, running a restaurant and every aspect of it, you get, I mean, think about it. A CEO at a company, what is, he, what is his skill set? You know, management, leadership, probably knows a little bit of financing. But when you're a small business owner, you're a janitor, you're a marketer, you're the HR director, um, yeah. you know, you're the process improvement guru. I mean, you, you do everything. And so it's a huge skill set. And, and that was a nice thing about the merchants is we could kind of help each other out. And I, I'm, um, one of the reasons I, I was glad to get out of the restaurant is I was really enjoying helping other businesses. I helped a uh, merchant downtown get, he was writing paychecks just out of his checkbook, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, which was not legal at all and <laughs> teaching him how to use um, QuickBooks and how to get it set up and didn't charge anything for it. And, um, but it was very pleasurable to be able to help businesses be successful because not all those owners have all those skill sets. And so, and as you know, most cities, you know, 85, 90% of all the employees are associated with a small business. Mm -hmm. That's a huge backbone in the community and they're often left out. You know, we like to attract the big businesses with the great jobs and that's fantastic but the small business owner is the lifeblood of the community. And we want to make an environment where they um, can succeed. You know, we've got, like when we went through the coronavirus, the city was so great about offering free uh, PPE and signage, and we'll help you explain this, and here's procedures, and you know, just offering free help to the community was a great gesture, gesture for the business owners. And then, you know, other things like the restaurants downtown, if, if you've been down there lately, there's outdoor decking along the roads now in, in place of some of the parking. And that's been a, a life-saving thing for those restaurants because they just don't have the room inside those little buildings to seat 25% and be able to afford payroll, you know, to serve just the limited stuff. So now they can get people overflowing outside and it's make them, made them more viable. They're still struggling, but at least they can open and operate and, um, you know, help get through this because those unique restaurants, that's kind of the, the, the flavor and the culture of downtown. You don't want to lose those. That's a big loss. And we, we did lose a couple. We lost Ninja Sushi in, um, in my old restaurant. You know, he sold it as soon as the pandemic hit. Um, but anyway, so, so I think that's nice when a city can wrap their arms around those small businesses and other entrepreneurs too, just offering to help. Uh, I'm in a group I run every Wednesday. It's called Advanced Business Roundtable. And we just have a bunch of small business owners and we share ideas and, and struggles. And, you know, it's a, it's a really good support system for each other and offering encouragement. And, uh, well, building a small business, you know, you're talking about these um, alliance partnerships, if you will, where, whether it be the roundtable or I know you built uh, something when COVID hit where you got a volunteer workforce together. What was that called again? Roseville Volunteer Force. So that was oh. 
that was incredible. Yeah, yeah where you did enormous feats in, uh, in, in very short window of time when we needed it most. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, uh, that's the, the sign of a, uh, a community that's got a certain amount of strength to it is when people can rally together like that. And, and I think Roseville uh, is uncommon in that way. Um, but I guess maybe that would be a, a question as to, so that doesn't happen by accident, right? To me, it doesn't, these, um, um, these success stories like Roseville don't happen by accident. They happen sort of uh, incrementally through improvement, whether it may, may have been a part, you know, hey, you're, a guy has a trouble with his permit, you know, you get a little improvement because he, uh, he's a little bit of a squeaky wheel, but, um, and he suggests ideas. And, um, but thinking about uh, what makes a, a healthy, uh, a healthy city or a healthy region. I think culture is an aspect of it. Obviously, economic, uh, you know, uh, strength is a, is a big deal. Where are we at now? As you think about Roseville and South Placer and the greater economic, the greater region, where are we at right now? I know we've kind of got hit in the stomach a little bit with uh, with the coronavirus, but things felt like they were kind of sailing along pretty smooth. Where, how would you, how would you characterize our, our health today? Well, we had an interesting situation. So when I was first elected in 2016, the first two years, um, actually almost three years, all we did was figure out how to cut an additional four or $5 million every year. You know, our, our expenses were going up and our revenue was going up, but the expenses were outpacing the revenue. So every year we had a $4 million, $5 million gap. We had to cut more and more services. And it was- Right, we're talking about the city of Roseville. Very frustrating. And, and as a council member, it's like, we can't do anything cool. We're just cutting everything. It was horrible. So we did this measure B, which is a half cent sales tax. It was on the 2018 ballot and it passed really well. But we spent a lot of time educating the community because nobody wants to pay more taxes. I mean, that's- Right, tax, ah, uh, yikes. But that was such a huge blessing for our community. We were able to get the service levels back up. And, and one of the first things our council did, which I was so impressed because I've seen councils kick the can down the road, you know, we'll deal with it later, but we took a big chunk right away and we stuck it in a reserve fund. And then started, you know, rebuilding our services. And when the coronavirus hit, you know, we were hit heavy in parks and rec. We had to shut everything down. But we didn't have to hire those hundreds of employees over the summer because we didn't have any programs. So that helped us a little bit. And this savings that we were able to set aside, it matched our deficit. So we were okay. We, the city of Roseville did okay. And this next fiscal year, you know, we're still not quite sure what's going to happen, but it's not going to be horrible for us because that half cent sales tax has really helped us. We have some other cities that are, don't have that kind of blessing and they're really struggling right now. And so we're still all waiting to see, you know, how much funding will come from the federal and state you know, through the state to, to help our cities out. But I'm, I'm just really proud of Roseville because it was the community that had the vision to, to help solve our financial problem by taking just a little bit more. It's like $50 a family per year. Um, and man, just huge, huge difference for us. So thinking about Roseville, um, and this is, uh, you know, I, I look at everything's a leadership issue. That's one of my mantras. Everything is a leadership issue and getting a group of people that all come from different walks of life to, to get on a council and basically volunteer their time. You guys to barely get paid to, uh, to basically make some of the bigger decisions that, uh, that need to get made, the tougher decisions that need to get made. Um, you think about that and the getting people to work together. So you got the city. I look at this. So I grew up in Roseville and, and I love Roseville. I bought my uh, burial plot in Roseville. My wife and I'll be married next, or excuse me, uh, buried next to Roseville High School. So I kind of feel like that is my original hometown. I now live in Loomis. Well, actually Rockland for a second here and I'm going to, I'll be in Loomis, but the, I always think of Sacramento is the, is my hometown. It's the greater, the greater Sacramento area is, um, it needs to thrive, I think, in order to, um, to really be healthy. And so uh, how does, how do you, when you view people who think a little bit like I do, like, look, we need the regional economy to, to have strength. What's the responsibility of a, um, of a local municipality? I mean, obviously Roseville's got 
you know, a, a high population, um, but it's not as big as Sacramento. How do you view your responsibility in terms of uh, a role in terms of leadership for the, uh, for the entire region? Well, I think, you know, sharing ideas, we have several different forums that elected officials can serve on. And then what we do personally, I think, makes a big difference, too. So right now I'm chairing the Placer County Economic Development Board. And on that board, we have, you know, the president of Sierra College, the president of William Jessup University. We have electeds from every jurisdiction in the county. We've got major industries like healthcare, the executive director of the Galleria Mall sits on the board and, and we share that, you know, every quarter what's going on, you know, what, what some of the struggles are, what, what new is coming. Um, and that's been really helpful, I think, just hearing what other jurisdictions are doing because then we can take notes and follow up and um, compare ideas and figure out how they're doing it. And I think that's a blessing is to share. You know, Sacramento, uh, Barry Broom's got a, a really good group. Our, our mayor currently sits on that board and that's economic development for the whole Sacramento region. I think that's very powerful. Again, sharing ideas, trying to draw some of those bigger companies into the region. You know, we don't care necessarily what city, we just, we want the jobs, we want the economy to be strong. Roseville did something interesting a few years back as we took um, some of our money out of a state fund and we put it into a local bank. Yeah, or, or multiple local banks that are locally headquartered and they give us a higher interest rate than the state fund does. And then part of the deal is they have to guarantee they're going to loan out certain, you know, amount of millions of dollars a year to small businesses from our city. And so just the loan, you know, that funding is all staying local. Is that part of the rise program by any chance? Oh, we're, we're better than rise. It's a different, it's different than that. Okay. We've we highlighted rise on our show a few times. <laughs> And, and it was actually your show that got, gave me the idea. So then I started reaching out to those bank presidents and asking questions. And, and so they came in and met with our CFO and that kind of got the whole process going. But it, wow. was, it, was, it was a great thing. And that, that's a benefit. It helps our region. Um, the other thing I want to mention, you asked the question earlier about, you know, how, how helping the local economy, you know, what that does. And so I'll just give an example about a restaurant, just one restaurant. So you have, say, a dozen employees in that restaurant. <clears throat> in, my, in my restaurant, they would get more in tips than they got paid hourly from me. So that's not too bad of income, especially for the adults that work there. For the kids, that was great income. Um, it's, it's not upper echelon you know, income, but it's, a lot of them, it was a side job for them. But that money that, that comes from the community into the restaurant goes out to those employees. They spend that money typically locally. It can go into mortgages. It goes into shopping. And sales tax dollars comes back to the community. Those sales tax dollars goes into police and fire and parks and you know, all the amenities that we love, the quality of life aspects of our community. The owner of the business making profits takes those profits and can invest, um, you know, again, into the community, not just spending and mortgages, but maybe you know, expanding their business. And, and so having all these real healthy businesses do that, it just helps build up your whole economy. And so it is a benefit to work down at the small level. Um, but again, you're talking about the whole region now. I, I think that's, I like the way we've been collaborating. I enjoy your radio show. I get to hear about all kinds of new businesses in the region I, I didn't know about before. And um, I think that's a, a good way to tie people together as well. Well, it's interesting, you know, some of the things that you, you've talked about and mentioned, been, we've alluded to a little bit today, we talk about culture, right? So inside a company, there's a culture. You, you had a culture that um, obviously drove a lot of tips, right? You, hey, it's like, that's part of that culture. And I think a city can have a culture, and I think a region can have a culture. California can have a, a culture, and I think maybe even the United States has a, has a demographic or a and kind of a culture. Um, and I think a lot of times getting people to work together, I always think of culture as sort of like the, uh, uh, the composite of the uh, attitudes and behaviors of the people who uh, exist in the business or, or in the city. And so it's that composite that, that really uh, sort of it ends up becoming our image and it's either attractive or people want to bail and get the heck out. So Roseville has always been more on the attractive side. And I, and for me, it was because of the people and growing up there and maybe some nostalgic reasons. Um, but in reality, 
the park systems are phenomenal. The police and the fire, the safe, and the, it, how safe it is, is a big deal. Um, and it's, you know, whether you can get a permit through the process fast is a big, you know, everything matters. And so I guess I'm thinking to myself is in terms of culture, um, what, you know, how do, in this day of age, when we're so divided, it's like, how do you drive a something that's a, a some continuity to a, a brand or a culture that people can sort of rally around well i'll give you an example we, we had a, a a meeting set up i think two years ago and they were i think six people that do location or uh, site finding for large companies so they go out and they you know a company wants to expand in a certain area and they go out and find sites so we brought them into the sacramento area and we brought them into placer county and we got to give them a presentation about why this is such a, a wonderful place to expand a business and so some of our sales pitch is you know roseville has the cheapest electricity in the state i think right now I mean, we've got cheap electricity we're a full service city so we own everything as residents we own our own park system and police and fire and water treatment and wastewater treatment and garbage pickup and we own all that stuff and it's very affordable so for a large business coming in especially if you're a manufacturing firm or you know big company electricity is really expensive and and so having that as an offer it's like hey we got cheapest around you know that's that's a big plus our community diversity is fantastic roseville you know, we're one of the top places that number four in the world in the nation for millennials to buy their first home and we're like number 11 or 12 for people to retire in the whole state i mean the whole country that that's you know we got both ends the, mm -hmm. and and then you go up to loomis you know loomis has big open areas with you know a lot of property and you can get up to auburn where you've got a lot more country and a little more in the mountains, maybe even get some snow. And so within a short area here, I mean, it's a great place to live because there's all kinds of things to do. And even if we brought a huge business into Roseville or even one of the surrounding cities, everybody benefits because you're going to have those employees out buying homes and you know, being part of mm -hmm. the community. And so we sell the region. And you know, Sacramento has a lot to offer. We've got some great sports teams. You know, we're, we're close to skiing, we're close to um, the bay. You know, we've got cool things right here, cool amenities right here. Our downtowns are just getting better every year. And those are great sales pitches for a company coming into the region. You know, we all benefit from it. You ever feel yourself or may, maybe I'll speak for, yeah, yourself, but and I'm, I'm assuming you've witnessed when people start feeling competitive, especially, so Barry Broom, you mentioned GSAC, right? These guys are uh, driving economic growth for the entire region, including uh, South Placer and Sacramento and so on. So they're, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to help the whole region where you might have uh, an individual city looking out for their own tax base, for their own, uh, you know, police and fire and, 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 and that kind of thing. And, and maybe a little feeling a little bit more individualistic about um, uh, economic growth, right? I want, I, want to, I want the Costco in my hometown or I don't want it in my town because it's, uh, it's gonna end up uh, you know, causing traffic problems or what have you. So from a competitive standpoint, I mean, do you, do you ever see that where people are uh, in the leadership feeling really competitive with one another? Well, I mean, we, <clears throat> For a tax base and for your own community, of course, you want to have that business come to your community. I, in the circles and the things I participated in, I, I think uh, we just want to, we want to get a contract in our region. I think that's the important thing. If you have a couple cities specifically competing, hey, they're competing. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's just going to happen. And when we're done, we'll all celebrate together and, and we're happy they at least came to the region. Um, I don't, you know, I, it gets weird. Uh, I think generally everybody's pretty, they understand the situation. They're very supportive of the concept. And I, I think that's the key. Uh, you know, of course you can get into like campaign season, uh, everything gets political. And then after campaign season, everybody becomes normal again. But um, generally I think most of the people around here hold hands. I know in some of those meetings, I'm sure there's, there's a, uh, yeah, I'm not in the middle of those GSEC meetings, but I can just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> sure it happens i i sort of wonder that stuff i haven't really 
uh, I've shied away from um, most of the political aspects of things. Uh, and especially on this show, um, you know, I've tried to focus on winning, right? What can we all agree on? Because we're, at the end of the day, we're a lot more alike than we are unalike. So what, what common ground do we have? We all want uh, successful companies here in our region. We want them in Roseville, we want them in Rockland, and we want them in Sacramento. We want them in Folsom, El Dorado Hills. We want them here. Um, so now it's like, how do we work together to, uh, to put the best team on the field to, to get them here and also create this environment uh, where we can from where we can grow from within. So it seems to me that uh, yeah. Yeah. that there's a big effort toward recruiting people to come in and relocate their businesses here. But I always think of um, you know fam almost like families. Like what can we do with what's already here? I already have my family here. I want to grow from within my family. I'm not going out and recruiting new family members necessarily. And so how can we create? these bonds and these ways of thinking one family at a time, one person at a time, one family at a time, one entrepreneur at a time and have a success driven set of philosophies and principles and um, you know, behaviors and habits and so on. If we can do that, then now we've got this sustainable thing. We don't have to go hunting for the big elephants uh, in other uh, jurisdictions. It can be, we can actually create what I call an economic, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial revolution where entrepreneurship is such a cool thing and I wanna build it here because entrepreneurs want to help one another the cities and counties and even the state wants to jump in uh, at whatever level to either get out of the way or uh, pave the way uh, so that success can happen so to me it's like man if we can just focus on one uh one small victory at a time, then that you, somebody's going to turn out to be the next sleep train or the next Sacramento Kings or the next uh, Blue Diamond Almonds or, uh, you know, something like that. So, but we just need to find those, uh, those small businesses because some are going to really fly. That's, that's important. I think that's why shows like yours and some of the organizations that we have set up and some of the consultants in the area, we have so much opportunity with our existing businesses, keeping them here and giving them enough tools, <clears throat> education to help them expand and grow. Placer County has a great business resource center that you know, can educate people and, and teach them new skills that they don't have. And getting business owners to um, work on the business instead of in the business, we're familiar with that phrase. You know, that's really important to give them the tools to stop being an employee of their own business and have them step back and grow that business and start expanding. Here on the west side of Roseville, where I live, we have 45,000 people and not a single gas station or restaurant or grocery store. And so we all drive across town to get those things. We do have some, and we have a lot of commercial zoned areas and they've sat vacant. We have a couple that are activating now. One's broken ground and there's gonna be a couple restaurants and a little strip mall and, and that's fantastic. And so one of the things we're doing, I'm doing and I'm sure others too, is behind the scenes talking to other business owners. Hey, you know, you ready to open up that second restaurant? Are you ready to expand? You know, your nail salon is so popular. We need one out here. And, and those kind of, um, that's where I can work behind the scenes because I, I'm known, I mean, all the electeds are generally known more than normal people. And when I can approach somebody, I can get a meeting with them and, and just give them a lot of encouragement. And, and I think the tool sets are there for a good business to start growing. And I think that is a huge key. I mean, yes, we still want to attract big businesses. We've got to save the ones we've got and give them enough tools and opportunity to help them start growing and expanding because that internal wealth is, is big for us, especially those mom and pop shops become million dollar businesses you know that that's huge for a community yeah well I, I i respect and i tip my cap to what you're doing you know entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs with your with your round table with these words of encouragement sometimes it's knowledge um, sometimes it's encouragement sometimes it's a helping hand of some kind but a, a lot of times it's about confidence so and it's, it's interesting and i don't know if you've had this in your life scott but like with these little things in your life that give you at the time when you need it just a little bit more confidence to 
to, to, to open up that second location. And then from there, things take off. But if, if nobody would have given that little encouragement, give that little seed of confidence planted, um, how many great companies would be would have stalled out at some point? So I, I respect what you're doing. And, and, I, and I guess uh, so many times a lot of people are shy, I guess. Why don't more people do it? I guess is kind of a question. It's a big risk. That's why they, they've got to hear the stories of other people who took that risk and, and decided to invest in that or take that loan <clears throat> or, you know, trust an employee to run this business so that they could focus on a new one. You know, those, those, I think that is what gives the encouragement, listening to the stories of other people doing it. That's huge. Having somebody who's a friend of theirs, you know, tell them you're doing such a great job. Your business has such a great reputation. Have you thought of expanding? Have you thought of, um, branching out or diversifying, that's important too. A lot of businesses are starting to find other ways to, to bring in revenue so you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Um, but, you know, I, again, that's why I, I compliment your show. I'm not, I'm not here to just uh, kiss up to your show, but it is really good. You do have a good variety on there. And I think that's really important in the region. And all of us talking, you know, we, we should have those feelers out connecting with those entrepreneurs because we have opportunities that we could give them or encourage them um, and get our names out so maybe they could seek and ask questions and hey do you know of any situations like this you know that's that's really important there's so many of us out there in the community that might have a tie or connection that could be super valuable to somebody um, you just got to talk you know that summit we did that um, economic summit together mm -hmm. it was yes. kind of, we had a lot of people in that room and we gave out some skills on and encouragement. I mean, it was, I thought it was a really good session just for all the people's interest. Um, yeah, you think about, uh, you, you've talked about Placer Valley and how you, you have a, the, a smaller coalition of cities and municipalities that are coming together. Is there a brand that's, that's developing or that has developed for South Placer, who we are, who we want to become, sort of that uh, you know, because some, it seems like some cities are known as being, um, I don't know, you get the wine country, it's known for, you know, uh, you know, obviously the grapes and so on. You've got Silicon Valley is high tech, Hollywood and Southern California has got its own image, Nashville. So when you think about South Placer, is there a certain image that it conjures up or that you would like uh, to have uh, conjured up? Uh, in terms of building a brand for ourselves that one that helps uh, attract people or even, you know, uh, retain them, keep them from leaving California. I, I think um, our, our Placer Valley tourism does a good job of, um, you know, they run the hotels. We also have an actual tourist, you know, the, the county has a division that does that. And I think what I've seen in the advertising, I think it's really good is we have a diversity of offerings, you know, like I said, we, we've got everything from Tahoe and snow skiing mm -hmm. down to, you know, the auto mall, the Galleria, um, the fountains, cool little airports, lots of great downtowns in several cities around here. I mean, just a cool eclectic collection and it's a great place to live. You, you like living in, you know, a big home with some land, here's a, here's a community for you. Do you like living in a walkable area? Here's a great spot for you. Um, high education, we have excellent schools. I mean, that's a huge trust for us. And so I think that's the story of South Placer and Placer altogether is just we've got a big variety of different things. And we tie into the Sacramento community that has all kinds of other areas as well, you know, going out to Elk Grove and all the way down to Davis. And I mean, there's just so many cool opportunities and such a great diversity of workforce here as well. Well, my daughter, um, and I think you know this, is a realtor. In fact, she's president of the Placer County Association of Realtors. And she's, um, she's, had, she's a young person, proud dad. She's had a lot of success in real estate uh, with her own company and, and in building teams and so on. Um, and what she is telling me, and this, this must be true because I'm hearing it from other people as well, people are, are coming to Sacramento and, and more specifically, they're coming to South Placer, Rockland, Roseville, Loomis. The, the real estate market is on fire. It is a seller's market. Much of it's coming from the Bay Area, but people are trading up as well. And so something's working. People are wanting to continue to stay here for some reason. While I also know that people are, you, know, you, hear, you turn on the national news, which I 
I've kind of quit turning on the national news as of late. That's crazy. But, uh, but uh, you, you know that people are uh, moving to go to Wyoming and, uh, you know, some of these smaller uh, flyover states because of, uh, they want to they wanna have a simpler life and, and so on, maybe a, a, a place where there's less uh, income tax. But for some reason, these suburbs that we live in, these small towns that we live in, um, we're not alone. People love this place. And my, I have a son that um, was trying to buy a home and they could not get an offer and they were just getting beat out all over the place because uh, they're first time home buyers. And so they ended up having to buy in Orangevale. So they're in escrow in Orangevale because they couldn't get anything else. And I've got several friends that are young and, and they're getting ready to buy their first home in the same problem. They put offer after offer after offer and they're just getting beat out right now. So um, there's a little bit of a problem there just internally. Yeah. Uh, eventually things will settle down. But as I, you know, I'm a, I'm a candidate for re-election. So I'm going to knock on doors. And in Western Roseville, where a lot of the growth is, two thirds of the people that I knock on the door and get a conversation with, they came from the Bay Area. So they're moving up here in droves because the quality of life is so much better. They can buy a much bigger home for way less money. And our utilities are nothing compared to what they're used to. You know, so you can get even a bigger home still. So it's definitely a draw for people that, that want to have a, just a higher quality of life. So that word is definitely getting out there. And yeah, quality it's a great time, great time to be a realtor. Yeah. Well, people are wanting to spend time at home. The people are, go, you know, you go to Home Depot or any of these uh, areas where you, uh, you know, might want to buy something for your home. Yeah. They're busy. Their Green Acres is blowing up uh, and they're based uh, out, of, out of here. So it's an interesting uh, time to, to be in that business. Um, and uh, it's, it's fascinating how, how long it will last. I guess, uh, is, is, did COVID start something uh, that uh, flight to the, uh, to the suburbs, if you will, or to, uh, from uh, living in the super dense densely populated areas to places where you can have a yard places where you know if i drive through my new neighborhood and you know i gotta drive seven miles an hour because i'm gonna i gotta make sure i don't hit any little kids in the neighborhood it's like this is a very a very cool place to to raise a family and maybe maybe the idea of uh and I think you and I talked about this the last time. You, COVID, if it did anything, I think it, it forces us to sort of step back and go, what's important to us in life? And for guys like me and you, family uh, is right up there. Uh, and it's what, it's, it's what we live for. And um, so to see that catching fire and becoming uh, a national, more of a national trend is, is, is pretty gratifying. It's interesting too, watching... I think this is going to be our new sales pitch is getting some of these Bay Area companies to, to put remote areas out because we've learned that you can work from home and you can actually get stuff done in a remote office. And I, I would hate to be a commercial real estate agent right now. Um, you know, it's tough because I think businesses are realizing maybe they don't need quite some of the footprint, which maybe it's opportunity for other businesses as well. You know, coming yeah. in. I hope so. Uh, just it's so weird. I, I think our world has changed now. What we're doing right now is going to be a regular tool that we use, I and mean, many of us never even really used it before. And you know, it's going to kind of be a way of life. Um, it's it's interesting how things have fast forwarded a little bit. Like uh, so, the global economy, right? We've had globalism over the last several years, and uh, I think in some ways this uh, this thing has this economic thing has, has caused a lot of things to fast forward a little bit, which means online businesses that can ship all over the world and so on are, uh, are the ones that are maybe thriving a little bit more than the, the brick and mortar and some of the ones that, um, you know, weren't as, hadn't invested into technology. But simultaneously, I feel like there's this new localism as well, where local people, I mean, people are buying, um, I had people during uh, the beginning of COVID buying me, uh, you're in a drive-thru, a line for drive-thru, and people are buying coffee for the person behind them because they're just trying to do the right thing for their neighbor or do something. It makes me feel good inside to do something nice for the guy behind me. I didn't do it, but somebody bought me coffee. And it's like, dang, that's, maybe there's a, uh, a trend that we're going to see back to family values and, um, and a small town thinking and, uh, you know, 
take care of your neighbors and so on. It's like, I have this hope that this is uh, more than a blip. I, I think the community has really responded well, you know, with our, with our lockdown and everybody kind of stuck at home. And, you know, we put things out on Facebook about businesses, you know, that need some help and please, you know, order to go. And we've got a, a thing going with, with Placer County, you know, different cities have different restaurants focus on these restaurants this weekend. And the community's really responded. You know, I, my wife and I order out all the time when we don't eat out normally that much, but we've been ordering out just because we know it helps the businesses. And I, the businesses have felt love. I know um, we have a, a local caterer there. They lost, you know, 700 events. What a huge loss. And so they had to pivot really quick to making to-go orders and, you know, something they didn't normally do. And the community just loved on them. Their menu got shared out almost a thousand times throughout. I mean, they just Is got that a, Randy it, Peters catering. It, it was. Yeah. Oh. They, they They're had, in my old building. I used to own that building. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. 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 Uh, that's there. yeah. A lot of respect for those guys. Yeah. So it's like, what do you do? That's what I love about entrepreneurship. It's about how hey, you figure it out. Right. Yeah. And they totally, they, they readjusted everything. They were able to hire staff back. I don't know if they got all staff back yet, but, but you know, a significant number and they still do quite a bit of business. And I still see people posting about, you know, Hey, just got Randy Peters you know, dinner tonight. And they're not the only, there's so many restaurants that are just being saved by our community. Um, you know, cause we'd lose these guys otherwise. And so I think it's fantastic that the community is just reaching out and trying, you know, Amazon delivery trucks are driving, <laughs> You know, I probably had a, about 10 go by just in this conversation and I'm in a cul-de-sac. So, yeah. um, but even so, I think people are still ordering, going locally and trying to order more online. You know, businesses have gotten online. If they want to survive, they got to get some of that product online so people can order. And I, I just see that happening a lot. I hear, you know, people talking about how they've, you know, I, I got that from that store. And, um, you know, so I think that's neat. It's fantastic to just watch the community rally around and help out you know, these business owners too. My mantra, and I, some people may have seen me up on billboards and stuff around Sacramento because of my relationship with Marquee Media, the, uh, the entrepreneurial billboard company. Um, but my mantra is put your money where your town is. And sometimes, you know, I invest locally. I try to shop locally uh, when I can. Um, and, of course, support the, the, the small business because I, I agree with you. They're the, you know, they're the backbone of uh, America backbone of our, uh, our small business. So I have a couple more questions because we, we, sadly, we can't go all day on this. I could, you know, we have a lot of common things that we care about. So two more questions. One, you, you, uh, you mentioned that you're running for office, which is we are, uh, I would be so scared about running for office. And, and I, because it seems like in many cases, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the ultimate vote, right? So if nobody listens to my show, maybe I don't really hear about it, right? Okay, one less listener, or even a lot less, it's going to show up somewhere. But like game day in November, you've done all this work for the big game, um, almost feels like a sporting event where you put all this effort into uh, this thing. And then there's the vote, right? And it's, uh, it's really the, uh, you know, it's hard to know where you're going to be on, on that day. So I, I picture the nervousness of a candidate, but for a guy like you, you've been there, done that. Um, and I've never sensed that in you, any of that nervousness that you've kind of like, what will be, will, will be. And I, maybe it's cause you're in a position to, uh, um, you know, have confidence that you're going to win. I mean, why aren't you, how come you don't ever act nervous? <laughs> well, I, so you mentioned the pay for city council. We get paid $7,200 a year. It's probably the cheapest council in, in the region, I think. Um, and so it's pretty much glorified gas money. And so you don't do this for the pay. So it's not like some of the other positions where, you know, it's actually a, a decent salary. This is a, your, you work your tail off. So I'm hoping that the community will elect you to be their representative and you pretty much are doing it to serve. I think there's, you know, there's people that are in it for power and stuff like that, but service is really what it's about. And if you're not in it to serve, you're not in it for the right reasons, in my opinion. And so the way I look at it is the community, I have an opponent and we're in districts this year. I'm glad I have an opponent. I think that gives the community an option. They should have options. We are representatives. So they, they're picking us 
to be their representative. I've worked really hard. Um, and, and the way I operate is I, I'm a cheerleader for the city. I'm a cheerleader for the neighborhoods and the businesses. And I, I really spend time connecting with them. I go to neighborhood meetings. I talk to business owners offline. You know, what's, how's it really going? Oh, hey, I know somebody might be able to help you. And I just try to serve them. My goal in my mind, and I'm, I'm kind of weird, I guess, but I, I really, when I'm all done doing this, you know, I'm not a career politician or anything. Um, I just want to look back and know that I gave it my absolute very, very best. And I did it for the right reasons. And now I'm going to move on with my life, but I never want to feel like I didn't, didn't give it my very best because then you have regrets. And so if the community votes somebody else in, hey, that's their choice. I'm okay. I got other things I can do. That's fine. Um, I'm willing to give it another four years and, and work just as hard. And, and um, one of my downfalls almost in a way is I, I'm responsive. I try to respond to people. So I get tagged in social media all the time. I get so many emails and voicemails and, and I spend a lot of my hours every day just responding to people and answering questions and the city staff are good and I can send stuff and they can answer the question if I don't know it. And, and I think that's kind of the wave of the future for electeds is, you know, the community wants somebody that is real and that will answer their questions and try to help them. Um, the downside of it is you get these um, jerks <laughs> that just say horrible things that are not fair. It's not real. It's, it's not even close to accurate or they get a little bit of truth and they totally twist it around you. Know, that's not fun because it's your reputation and, um, and that happens to everybody that's elected. There's always somebody that just sits back and takes pot shots and that, that kind of, uh, that's not real joyful and it's definitely not worth the pay, but just try to focus on, you know, I'm here to do something bigger than that. And you know, that just comes with the territory, I guess. And I think after a while the community starts to see that that's just a bunch of, you know, that's not what they see, how people behave. And so they kind of discount it, which I hope is happening. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I thought of one more question. So I'll save the final one here. So the second to last question, you, uh, you mentioned something to me. Um, I think you may have listened to one of our recent shows and I was talking about a new lane that we're opening up on the show around health. And it's not just about fitness. Uh, it's not about longevity. It's not about, um, it's about really the, the, the holistic approach to winning in life and in entrepreneurship. And, and part of that is who we are inside from a health standpoint. And, um, and I am by no means a model citizen, but I'm on, uh, at 56, I think we're, on, we're roughly the same age. Um, and I just don't have as many grandkids as you do, but it still matters to me. I'm thinking about, gosh, you know, I, I need to uh, make sure that I'm, going to be around for a while or do at least take my best shot at being around for a while for those for those grandkids it's going to be too fun uh, i don't want to miss it but i want it but i also think that uh being healthy uh i think it makes you you know if you're not worried about your health at all times um because that can drag you down you're going to be more successful and so and you're going to get more accomplished in your life. So thinking about that, right? So with everything you do, we didn't even get into all your businesses, your marketing companies, and, and I know you've created all these partnerships, um, but making time for you, right? Making time for Scott, you're so unselfish. Um, what do you do on that? And is that something that, uh, that you feel like is, uh, it, it, uh, where does it fit in your level of importance? Um, in your life today? It's, it's kind of uh, set aside right now, being honest. I think that the important thing for me right now is my wife and I are empty nesters. And you know, we had our, our two young grandsons, infant and toddler over and they spent the night recently because um, our, our son and daughter-in-law went to a wedding and they wore us out. <laughs> But, but it was wonderful. It was nice to spend time with them. It was nice to be grandparents. Um, so at home, the big thing for me is my wife. I think that's something I don't want to discount. I've, I've seen marriages struggle and, and have problems when that happens. So my wife and I have a habit of trying to watch at least a TV show or something together at night. We, we I would say, usually eat dinner together lately. It has been separate because we're both working quite a bit. Um, I haven't been bored in decades. You know, I, 
my dream is to go on some vacation, sit on a beach somewhere and actually feel bored, <laughs> but I haven't been. I, a lot of times when I'm watching TV, I even have a computer on my lap sometimes just, you know, trying to finish up a few things. And, um, but trying to be fully present when we're talking about something, if we go out to eat or we're eating together, just trying to, you know, learn about each other's day. And um, I've made mistakes in the past of, of kind of ignoring my wife and I definitely don't want to be like that. So that's probably my number one thing being available for my kids. Uh, we have group texts all the time. We used to do regular Zoom meetings. We've kind of backed off on those now, but for a while, you know, that was important. I definitely have to get back into a health mode, though. That's where I'm struggling the most. I, I've got a pull-up bar, and I've got, you, you know. You look like you're in shape. That's why I was sort of chatting. You said something like, yeah, I got to get back on track or whatever, something like that in a text. And I was like, shoot, Scott, you're in good shape. What are you talking about? I was kind of surprised you said that, to say the truth. My, my body will adjust quickly so I can get back in shape pretty quick. I've been losing weight, which is good, but I, you know, I think mostly because I've been walking neighborhoods. Not You've never over. looked heavy to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, my, my middle can get there, but uh, as a candidate, I'm knocking on a lot of doors. So I do a lot of walking. So I think that's been helping me a little bit, but I need to be more purposeful in some of the actual exercise. So that, that's, it'll come. I think after the election here, things will slow back down. I won't have quite so many balls in the air at the same time. Okay, so here's the final question. And this is more on the advice standpoint, because I think you've given a lot of, by an example, I mean, I think there's people listening or, or watching or whatever they're saying, who is this guy? I love this guy. Look, he's, uh, look at all the things he's doing. He's living uh, a life that um, any one of us would be so proud to be, to be living. Um, and I always look at like, okay, why, yeah, how did that happen? It didn't happen by accident. Um, are there any, if you had to give, uh, maybe the, uh, the younger generation, let's call it the, uh, the 18 to 30, 30 year olds that are like, try, are forming who, uh, who they really want to be as adults, um, in their minds, like, well, how do I want to live? I want to live a life where my grandkids love me and they come over and play, where I have businesses and success. I've got enough time to volunteer for my community and, and serve um, the way that you have with, uh, you know, with the church and with, you know, all the different things you do with William Jessup and so on. Like, I can see people just going, this is fascinating. I want to learn more. But how do I do it when I'm at the earlier stages? Any advice? I just, I just gave, I, I teach a marketing class at Jessup um, Monday and Wednesday mornings, and I just gave my testimony to them on Wednesday. And, and it's good for me too, because it reminds me of where I came from, because I absolutely have a life I don't deserve right now. I, I, I feel like I've been just blessed beyond what I deserve. And I owe that, I have to give that back. Um, I have a a quote that I think I live my life by, and I think it's something that I would encourage everybody to do. The first, first thing is when you're young, volunteer for every, every chance you get volunteer, raise your hand and be that person that steps forward. I became president of the downtown Roseville merchants because nobody else raised their hand. And then I got elected and then I kept getting reelected for nine years. And that gave me all kinds of neat opportunities I would not have had otherwise. I, I was a Boy Scout. I learned how to volunteer in Boy Scouts. That's kind of where it all came from. Um, my favorite quote in life, and I pulled it up here on the screen, but it's from Woodrow Wilson. And I think it's something that we all ought to live by. And he says that you're not here merely to make a living. You're here in order to enable the world to live more amply with a greater vision and with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich the world and you impoverish yourself if you forget that errand. So, we're here for a higher purpose. It's not just all about us. We're here to serve other people. And it's really hard not to be blessed when you take time and actually serve other people, I would think. And that's how it's been in my life. I, I've just, um, my wife and I have always tried to serve other people and we've been so blessed because of it. And I don't think I would have had those opportunities otherwise. Such a humble servant uh, for our community. Scott Albert, uh, I wanna thank you for finally uh, coming on the show. Um, for everything that you do for this hometown that we love, for being ex an example that I think we all look to, uh, to how to live a life that's, uh, that's meaningful. And I think that quote represents um, the way a lot, a lot of us want to live our lives. And so thank you for, 
for being that example, for being that success story, um, and, uh, and for being you. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the, in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.